I'm Shannon Tiezzi from The Diplomat, and I'm here today at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., where I'm very happy to have a chance to sit down with Dr. Christopher Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is the China Chair here at CSIS, and he's going to be talking with us today about what to expect from China domestically in 2015. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. I'd like to start out by talking about uh, China's anti-corruption campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the hottest topics in China right now, <laughs> and it has been for about two years now. Right. So at what point does this stop being a campaign and just become the new normal? Yeah, I think we've really already entered that phase, uh, and I think there's plenty of evidence uh, for that. You know, there's been a lot of speculation that when Zhou Yongkang, this former Politburo Standing Committee member, was brought under house arrest and now, of course, has been formally kicked out of the party and looks like he'll face trial just like uh, many previous people have, that that maybe was the apogee uh, of the campaign. But since that all happened, we've seen that they've now detained Ling Jihua, another very prominent official, former chief of staff to the previous president, Hu Jintao. And I think early in 2015, Xi Jinping is signaling very, very clearly that this is going to continue uh, to deepen. And so my expectation is, in fact, that we will see more of the so-called tigers, these high-level officials uh, in 2015. And the interesting piece with the Ling Jihua case is that while the connection to Hu Jintao is very significant, he's also a sitting official, an active official. Um, you know, the others, while very senior in terms of their former rank, were all retired. So this does, of course, open the door to thinking about other senior active officials. And I expect that's what we'll be seeing this year. I think the other key thing to watch for is, will Xi Jinping finally be willing to sacrifice a member of the so-called red nobility or these princelings, the children of uh, the people who founded the regime. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism that the campaign has only focused on Xi Jinping's political enemies or rivals, uh, and so I'm watching that space very closely as well. When he first started this campaign, a lot of people doubted uh, how far they could take this. Mm -hmm. um, there were concerns that having too many high-profile party members taken down would right. delegitimize the party. Exactly. How has he worked around that concern? Well, I think there's been a couple of interesting elements that tell us uh, what he's thinking about that. One is that I think he's just determined to uh, to move the campaign forward. And while those concerns and comments have been out there, you know, it was interesting, I think earlier in 2014, you can fairly say that there was sort of a whisper campaign, if you will, that was going around, uh, started by the people who were suffering uh, from the campaign saying that, you know, Xi Jinping is a megalomaniac, basically, uh, and is bent on being a new Mao Zedong, uh, and it's dangerous that the party could collapse because of this, because you can only uh, unravel that sweater, if you will, so much. Uh, I think what's been interesting about how Xi has constructed the public cases against these very senior officials, you know, typically when a senior Chinese official goes down on corruption, it's for some sort of personal failing, uh, either, you know, having lots of illicit cash or perhaps mis you know, things like this. It's been interesting in these cases that the charges that have been out publicly in Chinese official state media have related to building factions inside the party, which of course is the worst possible sin inside mm -hmm. the Chinese Communist Party. So I think Xi Jinping is having to use that kind of justification because it is so serious to justify what he's doing by going after these people. And it's really hard for the detractors to argue, well, no, we want factionalism within the party. So it's a very strong argument and, and reflects Xi Jinping's uh, political political acumen in my perspective. It seems like uh, Xi Jinping is more willing, and obviously within limits, uh, mm -hmm. but more willing than predecessors to kind of open up the party a little bit to mm -hmm. outside observation. Mm -hmm. I mean, observers, foreign observers have always said there are factions mm -hmm. within the party, but it's never been openly admitted right. in the media as right. we're seeing now. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, I think what we have to watch is what's the motivation? You know, is he doing this because he wants to open the party to outside scrutiny or is he doing it because it's what he needs to do in order to get it done? I think the thing to watch there is very interesting, right? So for example, while uh, we are seeing that. It's all being done by the party's Central Discipline Inspection Commission, right? They're in charge. It's the party supervising the party. And when folks try to go outside of that lane, such as some of these folks who've been arguing for, uh, you know, uh, officials to declare their assets, for example, those people are now in jail. So Xi Jinping has very much sent the signal the party will control this process. So I think he will open selectively, but uh, firmly under the party's control and his own personal control. And there's a similar theme with uh, Xi Jinping's declared focus on the rule of law, yes. which is going to tie into this corruption campaign as we see right. Zhou Yang Kang, um, mm -hmm. possibly Xu Tsai Ho, mm -hmm. actually move to trial. What should right. we expect from that process? 
I, I think you know that one uh, we're waiting and seeing. Uh, there's obviously a lot of cynicism about what this rule of law and a, a better translation of the Chinese is really rule by law um, actually means. What are they going to do with this? I think at core, in terms of the anti-corruption context, it's a sense uh, on Xi Jinping's part and Wang Qishan, the, the chief graft buster's part, that we need to create a more legal looking framework for this to respond to these whisper campaigns about how it's nothing but political uh, and there's no real substance to it. I think also they realize that by uh, sort of nesting it in the rule of law, you know, there were some interesting new mechanisms that were tabled at the recent plenum, the fourth plenum, uh, that if put into place will open a whole new road for anti-corruption investigation, but again, through a legal framework. And I think the sense is that that helps create a stronger justification for what they're doing. More broadly, I think what the whole rule of law piece is about is creating a set of tools by which the party can go after the state-owned enterprises, these other vested interests, to help move the economic reforms forward. Yeah, and that provides us a nice segue <laughs> to talk about China's economic reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, an uphill battle, but she continues to promote this. Mm -hmm. um, Li Keqiang keeps talking about the new normal. Right. Um, but how far is the government willing to go in accepting the trade-off of slower growth for actual economic restructuring? Yeah, I mean, my sense is this is the key question, and I think actually 2015 is going to be a critical year mm -hmm. in this regard. Uh, I think it's fair to say that from about uh, the summer of 2014 through certainly uh, the Central Economic Work Conference, which is their key uh, economic policy planning conference at the end of every year. The, to put it in a bumper sticker, the debate was basically to reform or to stimulate. That is the question. And I think right now there is a very robust internal debate over what is an acceptable growth figure, um, especially with regard to if it's quality growth, right, which is the term that we see them keep talking about, and how do you define Xi Jinping's new normal. Uh, the Central Economic Work Conference went some distance in doing that by saying that it has to be more measured growth, uh, more balanced growth, and focused on innovation-led uh, economy building, uh, you know, transforming the economy away from the export-led model toward a consumer demand, uh, continental-based economy, these sort of issues. But we'll see what growth number they announce here in another month uh, when they have their national uh, legislative session. Uh, the sense is it'll probably be 7%, which I think the consensus among most economists, Chinese and Western, is still too high in terms of sustainable growth over time. Do you think that we will ever see them actually make a break and say, we're not doing GDP targets anymore? we're moving away from that model entirely. I think they will. That's my sense. They, there are a lot of people pushing for this internally uh, within the system. And, and you know, folks have argued that if you want to show you're very serious about reforms, don't announce a growth number. The challenge is that all the incentive structures inside the system are geared toward these numbers. And let's face it, it's an objective target, right, that, that uh, party officials, especially in the provinces and lower levels, can seek to meet. And they know that even though those changes are coming into effect, their promotion, their advantage advancement within the system is still keyed to that GDP number. Until that situation changes, I think you're going to see a lot of resistance from that level of the bureaucracy uh, to going away from a GDP growth target because then they don't know what to aim for. Right. And we saw some small steps toward that recently. Uh, they've been including more environmental mm -hmm. incentives. Um, I would assume that process is going to continue. It is, yeah. And the party's organization department, which handles personnel uh, within the party, my understanding is they're redesigning the evaluation criteria to take those things into account. Um, it's come through very clearly in speeches that Xi Jinping has been making. It came out of the Central Economic Work Conference as well. And I think the key is to see how they address that issue in the new five-year plan, which is currently being drafted and will be approved at the fall plenum uh, later this year. Well, thanks so much for talking through these issues with us. My uh, pleasure. Always a pleasure. Great. And thank you for tuning in. Once again, I'm Shannon Tiazzi from The Diplomat.